Oh, sorry. I don't know that. Look, you Okay, so Ben's going to entertain us. He's going to do something funny or cool. Or not. Um, so, uh, this is in some ways my favorite topic. I mean, optimization, what could be better? You're finding the best thing, right? It's, um, here, here, look at this title. It's just got his name and one big word. Bach, man, that's um, really the key. But no, I keep <laughs> emphasizing all the different fields that are kind of coming together here. And uh, in every different field, optimization is kind of a, a central thing. What would, what would have CS theory been without combinatorial optimization sort of driving it along, right? And, and uh, linear algebra, even though it's about matrices, you know, Gauss was solving least squares problems. He was doing an optimization problem. And of course, statistics is replete with maximum likelihood, M estimation, et cetera. It wouldn't be statistics without optimization. Um, and so this field is so, you know, older than many of the other fields. Uh, at the same time, every sort of 10 years or something, there's some brand new idea and it leaps forward somehow. And so the last 10 years with all the kind of the Russian schools, all their ideas flooding the West by the breakup of the Soviet Union, it's been really refreshing to see. And so Ben is an expert on that stuff and he'll probably convey something exciting. Thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, and I, I think uh, much of today's talk is actually borrowed from my, uh, a lecture note prepared by Stephen Wright. Um, who unfortunately couldn't join us today because it's the first day of his class, so just suboptimal scheduling. But uh, I'm going to do my best to do the Steve Wright impression without the Australian accent. Um, and yes, I'll be talking about optimization, which, as Mike was saying, is anytime we need to minimize or maximize some cost and we're subject to some constraints, we have an optimization problem. And I, I, I think it's quite clear that's far too much to cover in three hours. Uh, and, 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 and moreover, like, like, as Mike was pointing out, there's lots of different branches and breeds of optimization, so we can't really do everything. So what we want to focus is like what, what would actually, what are the aspects of optimization that are kind of most uh, uh, predominant and salient in whatever this big data area is right now? Um, so I, I would say that not all the time, but a large proportion of the time, the problems we end up solving end up looking slightly more constrained. I mean, this is just as actually, this is just as general as the one on the previous slide, it turns out, but that's fair. This, uh, at least this focuses our attention. We're looking at problems where we're going to minimize an expectation subject to constraints that are actually somehow simple. Um, the expectation in here, we actually will typically be fairly well behaved. Uh, this is going to be some nice distribution which we're receiving samples from uh, or which we can, we can integrate. And, and when I say the, we're looking at the convex hull of A, we're looking at the set a is going to be simple somehow. It's going to have low description length. It's going to be something that we can easily optimize over. And this really does now narrowly restrict things. And at least allows us to talk about how the complexity of these optimization problems. So we're going to um, also today discuss kind of a closely related problem where we also have a, a, a function p which is going to encourage x to be somehow simple or low complexity. So the idea is trying to find low complexity models that somehow minimize expectations. Uh, more often than not, to minimize agreement with data, or maximize agreement with data, is kind of the problem that we always want to solve. F is not convex or anything. Well, F is going to be convex. Okay. Not, not yet, not yet. We're going to talk about that. But yeah, let's not get ahead of ourselves yet, but yes. So let me talk about, let me give a couple examples that are like canonical. And, uh, and uh, F is always going to be convex in my examples here. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about non-convexity as, as, as things go on. So the support vector machine probably is the um, also known as logistic regression or linear regression by, by small permutations, one of the most popular, pervasive, uh, and important optimization problems. Um, the idea here is that we, we are given some data. They lie in some space, usually RD. So we have d-dimensional uh, vectors. Everybody has a plus label or a minus label associated with them. And the goal is to find a hyperplane that separates these uh, data points so that you're most of the time labeling uh, uh, um, examples that come from the positive region with positive numbers and the ones that come from the negative region with neg negative numbers. And so this has been very popular in medical diagnosis, uh, in, in credit card fraud. I've actually worked with some physicists who, uh, who have used this to classify uh, whether or not cosmic rays are moving up through their detector or down through their detector. Uh, and so you have a variety of different ways of just kind of coming up with yes or no answers. And the optimization problem here is actually uh, pretty easy to state. It's you maximize something which is called the hinge loss, 
where y here is the label, z is the example, and x is the hyperplane we're looking for. And you're just trying to maximize the agreement here. If the label is, is positive and this dot product is positive, uh, then we don't pay a cost. As long as this is sufficiently large, this is very negative, that goes to zero. And if you get a sign mislabeling, it rolls off linearly. And as you see here, we have an average over all of the examples. And then we add on a penalty here to select a low complexity model. In this case, I'm just taking a really simple one. We're just penalizing with the Euclidean norm. You could penalize with an L1 norm if you would like a sparse answer or a variety of other norms. The L1 norm comes up in what's called the lasso, um, which people have used in compressed sensing, where they would like to reduce the number of measurements required to uh, acquire signals. Um, or in other kinds of sparse modeling and sparse statistics where you're really looking for a set of covariates that best explain some kind of phenomena. And in this case, we'd solve something like this, where we have a sum of squares, sum of least squares cost. Uh, AI here now would be either the data or the acquisition pattern. Um, BI would be the output, and you would have a penalty on the L1 norm being less than R. So this would now try to encourage either a sparse signal or a sparse signature from your data. Uh, just one more example, which uh, we've discussed today is the matrix completion problem where we have some uh, a, a data array we see a sparse collection of entries in the data array um, we assume that that data array somehow is is low rank because we kind of assume that maybe a principal components model would be good enough to explain a lot of the variance in the data um, in this case right the, the this model obviously has far fewer parameters than they want on the other side and so what we could just do is penalize the sum of the squares on the observations to the model we're looking for and now here we have the penalty term. Now we're going to have a, uh, a penalty that's going to encourage x to be as low rank as possible. Okay, so that's, that's a, uh, one other possible answer. So, um, oh, I had one more. So here's something actually just more combinatorial, but, uh, at what, but very commonly known. And I learned this actually from Christos' book, that this is actually a linear program. Uh, so, that, so if I would like to find a minimum cut in the graph between two points, um, then we know that that actually can be formulated as a linear program. This has been used a lot actually in data analysis more recently as ways of doing image segmentation, as ways of doing image fusion, fusing, uh, ways of doing topic modeling and entity resolution. And this actually, uh, you could write it down as an LP, or if we kind of squint a little bit, what this is is minimizing the sum over all edges that are present in my graph. You put each of the vertices is assigned a vector in 0, 1, and then on some set, you'll have ones that will be fixed, some sets you'll have zeros that will be fixed, and this will actually solve that LP. You know, actually, it turns out that this problem, you'll either get a one or a zero, and that's the only solution on all the vertices. But it does have that form, and now we can actually think about this graph being random, and now think of that, that being an expectation as well. Okay, so that's kind of like just some canonical examples, just kind of going through kind of the generality of what we've been, uh, uh, of how we can model um, uh, certain data analysis problems. Okay, so, just to kind of just refocus, why do we care about optimization? It's everywhere. There were some examples we just gave. Uh, almost anything can actually always be reverse engineered into an optimization problem. So you can always, it gets almost uh, to the point where everything becomes optimization. Uh, one of the really nice features is that it's modular, so that if you have some two different kinds of modeling of simplicity, you can adjoin both of those constraints and try to solve that optimization. And provided you have convexity or something similar, you can actually just solve the resulting composite optimization problem as well. Um, and it's also what's interesting for, I think, people who do uh, things like SQL and databases is, is optimization is inherently declarative. I mean, you kind, of, you, you kind of state what you'd like. You know, I'd like it to be sparse and low rank, and I'd like to minimize some, I would like to minimize this function subject to uh, these constraints. And almost by just stating that, not only have you posed the problem well, but what we'll see is we actually have algorithms that will just naturally solve it as well. So it kind of allows us to take algorithm design a little bit out of the... Uh, outside the loop. Now, you could specialize and focus and really kind of hone in and get a very specialized algorithm. But what's nice about this is that for people who are, don't want to be optimization specialists, you can really make packages now, and there are a lot of them. CVX, TFOCS, CVX Opt, I could, there are a bunch where you can you really just state the problem, and if you state the problem in a reasonably disciplined way, you can, hope, you can be assured that the solution that comes out will be the one that you wanted. So you don't have to think necessarily about algorithms. OK, so let me focus on what am I going to talk about? What aspect am I going to talk about? We, we honed in on some data analysis problems. And I want to look at the space of problems that can be solved by iterations that kind of look like this. We take an iterate xk, which is what the solution we're looking for. 
uh, we add to it a vector v, which is hopefully some direction that's going to improve our cost, and that's our, that's our, that's our algorithm. This is typically gradient descent, and that's what we're going to spend all of today discussing, is kind of how far can we push gradient descent and gradient descent-like algorithms to solving those kinds of, of uh, problems that arise in data analysis. Um, and what we'll see is that basically what we'll, there are a variety of kind of special cases. There's the conjugate gradients and accelerant gradient methods. Um, there are stochastic gradients, which are really kind of dealing with the fact that our data is random and is coming from some random process. There are projected gradients, which allow us to incorporate constraints. And essentially, what we'll see is we'll go through each of these three topics, and then basically you can mix and match at will any of these ingredients. You can accelerate the proximal method with stochastic losses. You can do a variety of different kinds of, uh, of it's very modular even in this kind of algorithm design. So that's today's lecture. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about duality. Um, and because the other thing that optimization is very good for is proving things, especially convex optimization. Convex optimization gives you tools to uh, uh, do average case analysis of a lot of data analysis problems. Because uh, this is prevalent in machine learning. This is kind of the whole idea behind generalization bounds. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to focus on uh, one example from compressed sensing, kind of going through the machinery that we've seen in random matrix theory and how that ties in with convex optimization to prove things about the number of measurements you need to recover sparse signals. So we'll actually walk through that. Tomorrow will be a, a whiteboard talk, which, uh, uh, and we'll go through kind of the nitty-gritty details. And, but it won't, it will, we can actually complete uh, from, from zero to a proof uh, kind of some of the basic compressed sensing results, just using some notions from duality. For the, for, I mean, this has kind of been known in combinatorial optimization for a long time, but why this is powerful, I mean, this basically, if you have a min-max characterization of your problem, that essentially immediately lands you in NP-intersect co-NP. If, if I can basically test whether the, the value of a primal example, I could test the value of a dual example, now I have a short proof and a short certificate. And so, it's not entirely true, but MP intersect co MP usually aren't too bad. Are, usually, that's a good place to be, and that typically can land you, land you to P, which is, what, I think, one of the really interesting things about duality. Uh, and what we'll see tomorrow is that it's kind of also, this is the basis of many proof techniques in machine learning and signal processing, and obviously in combinatorial optimization. Okay, but we'll get to that tomorrow. So for today, let's go back to the gradient descent. Uh, and let me just list, I mean, I tried to put out one slide of what we're skipping. I could, I could probably go on for an hour and a half about what I can't talk about in an hour and a half. Um, so I'm going to skip over things like second order information, which are incredibly important and actually I think are kind of the frontier of where we should be going, kind of incorporating extra information that allows algorithms to converge faster. Uh, I'm going to skip over the interior point method, the ellipsoid methods, all these kind of second order methods that people probably know and love. Uh, I'm going to skip over active set methods and manifold identification and really kind of the, the really cutting edge techniques in nonlinear programming. I've got to skip over branch and bound, which is also, and all these other branching cuts and these other things that are quite useful for solving uh, uh, difficult problems. Uh, and, and really, I'm kind of going to leave out all of the combinatorics, which is too bad, but hopefully we can start integrating those things back in uh, throughout the semester. Um, I'm going to skip derivative free optimization. I like derivatives. <laughs> I'm actually probably going to skip mostly, I'll talk a little bit about non smooth optimization, but for the most part, we're uh, going to assume that our functions are smooth today. I'm going to skip heuristics. Okay, I probably the most important thing I'm skipping, kind of the most important thing about optimization is I'm skipping modeling. I think um, that's actually really an underappreciated part of optimization. It's not just enough to be able to solve the problems when they're given to you, it's about being able to pose them. It's kind of like half of the battle. It's just being able to pose, uh, essentially, um, just like in least squares for convex optimization, if we can pose a convex optimization problem, usually the algorithm, we can get a polynomial time algorithm for sure. You can get an efficient algorithm a lot of the times, too. Okay. So that's kind of a longer conversation. Okay, let's go back, start with the simple thing, minimizing function f subject to x and rn. f is now uh, un completely unconstrained. Uh, let's assume it's smooth. Uh, so what do we do? We search for a point where the gradient vanishes. And we basically turn this geometry problem into an algebra problem and say, find me an x where that gradient goes away. Um, and this is necessary for, for x to be optimal and sufficient for convex smooth f. And hopefully everybody's seen something to that effect before. Okay, good. So basically we want to say, how do we find a point where the gradient vanishes? 
So the gradient descent idea is basically trying to do a fixed point iteration. So, come on. So we start with a point, we start with our curve, we have our point, we find a direction that goes downhill to reduce the function, and we walk along it. So let's, let's see how actually how we analyze it, kind of just under that notion that we're looking for a fixed point. So here v is just going to be the negative of the gradient. And so we're going to say when it, let's just assume that this map, which takes x and maps it to x minus alpha grad f. Okay, and that's just gonna, that's our gradient mapping. Let's assume it's con a contraction. So if I take two points, I apply that gradient map, I look at their difference, that's always less than beta times their norm, where beta is less than one. Okay, so we assume that the gradient map itself is contractive. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that gradient descent is going to converge. And it's actually really trivial to see that it, it, as long as you have a contraction, you get convergence. And the reason why I'm going to kind of belabor this is what we'll see is that every proof of convergence, it's not, this is a little overgeneralizing, but today every proof of convergence is just going to define the invariant to be the distance to the optimal solution, and then do some manipulation, and you'll show that that decreases. And that guarantees that you converge. So in this case, uh, we, we just plug in the definition of our iteration. We use the fact that x star is a fixed point. If the gradient vanishes, then it's the fixed point of that map. That rewrites it this way. And then we have a contraction. And then we repeat a bunch of times. And we get down to something like this, where we say that after k steps, or k plus 1 steps, we're beta to the k plus 1 times our original distance. So that means we have an exponential convergence, uh, which optimization people call linear convergence. Whatever. <laughs> There's a reason you call it linear. It's really this step. It's just saying that the difference between the current iterate and the next iterate is a linear function. But it ends up be being an exponential rate of convergence. Okay. So basically what we just said is that if, if this gradient map is contractive, then we converge exponentially quickly. It turns out that there's something else that's underlying uh, all this convex optimization. Essentially, if your function, if your gradient descent is converging exponentially, that means you're minimizing a convex function. Um, just to, well, this, we could walk through this proof again. We're going to look at this psi, which remember is just the map that maps x to x minus grad x. And we'll just reformulate it. So we'll say x and we'll just take a step plus delta x, just a small infinitesimal step, and divide by that step size. Okay, and so that's just the definition of contractivity. And so if I take the limit as t goes to zero, what you see is you'll get this expression. You'll get the delta x minus alpha uh, times the Hessian of f times delta x. But in this limit, each of these guys is less than beta x, so the resulting limit is also less than beta x. And what that means is that the norm of this matrix, this is now a linear matrix, has to be less than beta. Okay, so basically by, by assuming this map is contractive, that actually means that this function, which is the identity matrix, minus alpha times the Hessian, is, has norm less than 1. Uh, and writing that out in a nice positive definite notation, that means that basically the Hessian is sandwiched between a multiple of the identity and the other multiple of the identity. This lower side means that the function is positive definite, and hence that means that f is convex. So essentially, by assuming that we have contractivity, that means we're actually it's the same as assuming convexity. Actually, it's, this is called strong convexity. And the top one basically just assumes that our gradients obey the Lipschitz condition. So convexity, as Ravi kind of, you just kind of, you kind of knew in advance, it's unavoidable in some sense if we're doing nonlinear optimization. If you actually go to old nonlinear optimization books, um, they, 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 they prove things in generality for general smooth functions. But then you go and look at the proof and they say, assume that you are in a basin around a local solution where you have a convex ball. So like everything in the proof is basically assuming convexity. You're assuming that you're somehow in a convex well. And that's why. I mean, it's basically once you assume that you're going to get an exponential convergence, you are locally in a convex region. So what does convex mean again? Well, it's just that the lines above the function uh, stay above the function. Um, that's a useful notion, but actually what in optimization, really what the, the better definition or the more useful definition for convexity is this one. So for smooth functions, basically you want to say that the, this red line, which is defined over here, is always under the function. Okay. So this is a linear approximation. You basically take the gradient direction at x, look at the under approximation, um, and if I add on, if I actually say something stronger, which is that 
the function is now, it, f of z is now uh, bigger than this linear approximation plus an extra term that's called strong convexity. The other thing that I say automatically happened when you assumed contractivity was that the gradient was Lipschitz. That actually just, but this actually just follows from Taylor's theorem. That means that you actually have an upper bound. So you have an upper and lower bound by these quadratics. Essentially, the convergence theory is just kind of pushing these two upper and lower bounds together. Well, you see, if, if you solve this one, just minimize it. Minimize this approximation, this upper approximation. What you'll see is you'll say, you'll, that will just be, um, let me see. We're going to minimize it with respect to z. That will basically just take us from x and add on the gradient. So minimizing this function is actually taking a gradient step. And so that's where you see you would walk down the hill to this point, and then successively walk down the hill until you hit the bottom. OK, so um, if I define this number kappa, which is the ratio of the strong convexity parameter to the Lipschitz parameter, that's always bigger than 1. And it's called the condition number. Oh, less than 1. Got backwards. Always less than 1. And I got it, I got it upside down. So I apologize here. We'll write that. Since that's going to come up over and over again without being def defined, kappa is capital L divided by little l. It's always bigger than 1. All right, typo number 1. All right. So that's called the condition number of the Hessian. It's basically telling us how oblong is the, is the deci um, decision surface. And the, kind of the, the, the key point is that if I can tune a constant step size alpha, take this 2 over L, uh, uh, well, this is just algebra. You basically just kind of optimize your constants a bit. You get this rate of convergence. So the rate of convergence is 2 divided by the condition number plus 1 to the k. Or if you'd like, you can do that in terms of the function value, and you get the same rate of convergence, depending on what you're more interested in. So it's 2 over the condition number plus 1, 1 minus that number. So what this tells you is if this function, if the condition number is huge, this is very close to 1. So even though you have an exponential rate of convergence, it's a very slow exponential. So. Now, I, I did everything here in this kind of very kind of squishy picture where we just had this constant step size. I overtuned it. I got this L plus L. Usually, we don't know these parameters. But there are actually ways that are very good at uh, adapting to these parameters. These are things called line search, where what you'll do is you'll take a step, and then you'll try to find a good step that's really giving you a good decrease in your function. And what's nice is that these local line searches, both in terms of backtracking line search, exact line search, there's thousands of these if you want to go look at some old hardcore nonlinear programming books from the 70s. Uh, there are lots of different versions of what to do here. Uh, and they all can basically, the number of gradient steps, in terms of the number of gradient steps, you get this rate of convergence. However, you do need to do this line search, which will uh, um, cost you some function evaluations. So there's a little bit of a trade-off between uh, the number, the, how, how good of a line search you do and what your rate of convergence is. But the point is that well, the other, the interesting thing is that even if you do these very sophisticated line searches, you don't beat what you get with a constant step size. So essentially, if you, if somehow, somehow, someone handed down that information about these the strong convexity parameter and the Lipschitz parameter, you should just use those, and that should be fine. So what happens? So here's my function. This has, I, I can tell you, it's just this is just a two-dimensional quadratic with condition number 100. Um, and let's say we start at that red dot and we run the gradient method, this is what it would do. So this is the example where we have a linear rate of convergence, but this is uh, about 40 steps and it's still a pretty slow linear rate. So any questions up to this stage? This is kind of like our canonic, hopefully this is maybe, you guys have even seen this as undergrads, yeah. But this case, it converge, or it converge, but it better to converge to that optimal point. It will get there eventually. You're just going to be waiting a while. This is interesting because I still don't capture the intuition, the geometric rate, but it's slow. Slow geometric rate, right? Because if it's 1 minus a number that's really close to 1, I mean, for all intents and purposes, I could make that as bad as I'd like. You know, you just make that 1 minus 1 over, you know, yes. so in this case, 1 over 100. You know, you can make this really, really bad. So this number is very close to 1 to the power k. Right, but the question is how large? So in this case, it says that even in practice, large could mean very large. So the question is, can we do better than the gradient method? 
Yeah, right. Shouldn't the gradient be pointing more towards the center there? Ah, uh, well, so what the gradient, so these are the contour lines. Yeah. Uh, so these are, and they're, the, they're decreasing, so it's high, low, lower. Uh, and the gradient per points perpendicular to the contour lines. And that's the problem here. So we're in this well, and it's like basically like doing a half pipe. That's what we're doing back, back and forth. <laughs> Very slowly. Not a Sean White style, though. It's taking us a while to get down to the bottom. So the question is, like, how do we can we do better than the gradient method? Uh, can we do better than the gradient method if all we're willing to do is compute gradients? So one thing that people that you may know of is something called Newton's method. I'm not going to talk about that today. Because that's actually not really well paired to uh, computation on large data. This, this algorithm tends to scale linearly with the dimension, the gradient method. Newton's method tends to scale cubically with the dimension. And that's typically prohibitive for high dimensional problems. It tends to be kind of put it out of favor. We'll do a comparison of all these later. But so I'd prefer not to do Newton's method. I would just like to do a better gradient method. So this leads us to the notion of acceleration. Also, what this is going to be called, which I, I think the best name for an algorithm ever, this will lead us to the optimal method. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good when you have an optimal method, but you know, optimal to, with respect to what? We'll see. So, the optimal optimization method. Okay, so <laughs> one way to think about this map, right, is like a finite difference approximation to this ODE. Okay, so we're basically following a differential equation, which is this potential well. Now, how do I make a? If I have, where's my? Where's, is Josh here still? Not, he's not here. So I'm going to single out the physicist. So if I have a potential well, and I would like to make it not oscillate, what do I do? I add friction. This is kind of something we do in mechanics. So, uh, so basically what I would do is I would go from a second order differential, first order differential equation to a second order one, adding a term proportional to the derivative. And that will prevent oscillation. So just adding friction uh, should slow down the oscillations in this function. And essentially, if I route the final difference approximation, I get something with now two time lags. Or another way, actually, the way I like to write it is as just two equations. We have, we're taking a step along P. P used to be the negative gradient, but now it's the negative gradient plus a memory term. So we're damping the gradient. We're saying we're going to go kind of in the direction we were in before. And this is a two-step method. Uh, it's a multi-step method, and this will tend to be faster. It's called the heavy ball method. It was invented by Polyak in the Soviet Union in the 60s. Uh, in the case that it's quadratic, Michael's not here, but that's all right. This is, this is known as Chebyshev's iterative method. So Michael talked about this in, the la in his the last talk is something that he was actually finding would be a better algorithm than conjugate gradient in a lot of implementations in terms of communication. And the reason you'll see in a second, I will bring back conjugate gradient. You can write it almost in the same way, except we're just going to change alpha and beta. You have to dynamically adapt alpha and beta. In the case of the conjugate gradient method, here we just have constant alpha, constant beta. Yeah? mentioned that one issue with this method was you had to have pretty strong guarantees on your conditioning. But intuitively, it seems here that you're precisely using it in a case where conditioning is nasty yeah. in order precisely to improve That's the right. limitations of kind of the naive gradient in, That's in right. the face of bad conditioning. Can you sort of sort out what that kind of intuitive mismatch that I have in my Yeah, mind? absolutely. So let me, let me first show why it kind of irons out conditioning. And then second, I'm going to get exactly to the, thing, the, the parameters you need. Okay. And then third, I'll get to this weird Nesterov algorithm that gets around actually having to know anything. So maybe even better than conjugate gradient. So let's do, we'll do that in that order. So the first is just, here's my ellipsoid again. My, now I've really zoomed in on red. So that was our gradient step, perpendicular to the contour. There's my gradient step back. But if I take a mixture of these two directions, I would actually go there. You up I wanted to go this way. Multiple of the, no, you should be adding a positive multiple of the Mm -hmm. So it's basically, so I was going this way, but I'm going to kind of push myself in this direction. So I go this way. That's my, and if I actually, I, I run that for the same number of steps, I converge. <laughs> so I am fine tuning this with, I have the exact parameters here. These are the best parameters for gradient descent. This is the best parameters for this heavy ball method. It really does make a big difference. Um, so how do we analyze it? Again, that who, who has a physics background here? Can um, go back yeah, we can go back. Because you're kind of motivating it as a friction term. Uh -huh. But that's non conservative, right? Energy wise. You're actually going uphill. 
Well, you're so, but that, with the, you're adding more force actually. So that's what's interesting is that you're using friction, but that allows you to actually drive with more force. And that's why you get to the, if, if you're going to use that same idea. The step sizes are bigger, but now you have a friction term that kind of damps you. So it actually allows you to kind of like swing your pendulum harder because it actually allows you to converge faster. So it's, 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 well, it's just, it's just, so the gradient method is driven too. You're taking steps, right? You have a fixed step size, and that's kind of forcing. That's how much of the potential you're using. So it has that forcing term. This lets you take even bigger steps. So no, I was just the same question I had. I mean, it's momentum rather than friction, right? You are going more, I mean, you are adding to your direction the last direction, not subtracting. Adding the last direction. Yeah, so right. Friction so, is a funny word there, but it's, it's Yeah, I see. Sometimes it's I called agree. the momentum method. That's what I was confused That's right. It is the momentum method. That's right. And this is a momentum because it's using that last, last term. But they're kind of the same thing because if you're proportional to the derivative, right? I mean, that's kind of damping you. Yeah, the sign. The sign, the yeah. Sign is what it is. It doesn't matter. If you make the negative, it diverges. I'll have to think about that. Let me not get too distracted, but that's a good question. That's a good question. You don't have you to slavishly follow the physics here. Huh? It's just some equations that go downhill. They do go downhill. <laughs> <laughs> they do go downhill. Well, let's, let's slavishly follow the physics, though. Now we're going to go back. Let's go back to our, our, our second year ODE class and see how to actually analyze this. So basically, the way that, you, the way that Poyak analyzes it, which I think is just beautiful, and the reason why I'm going through the, the, the heavy ball method is for anyone who's actually tried to look at the analysis of Nesterov's method, or even the Beck and Dubul version of Nesterov's method is incredibly counterintuitive. And the way that, the way that Arkady Nemirovsky, who is one of these kind of Russian school of optimizers, characterizes it, he says there is no, there is no intuition, there is purely computation. So you just, cal or sorry, calculation, purely calculation. You get everything so it lines up and you get a solution. However, Polyak's method, Polyak was Nesterov's advisor, is very intuitive. It's just, you know, you need these parameters. You kind of have to know a lot more than Nesterov does. So basically, the idea is instead of having a Lyapunov function with just the current iterate, you have now di the distance to the current iterate and the distance to the previous iterate to the optimal solution. Um, you take your, your, if we linearize this, so basically I'm assuming this is quadratic, our step is basically a matrix times our previous w plus a low order term, and it's me being a physicist. <laughs> little, this is little o in the physics sense, in terms of we ignore it, not little o in the computational complexity sense, in terms of maybe that's a, uh, but it, I, I think they're, they're similar, it's small. So when we linearize it, basically we have this matrix, which this was the, the, the Hessian that had, we know the condition number of, and then we're adding on this kind of shift matrix. So if I go back again here, you have your Hessian plus one plus beta minus beta i and zero. The so lambda here, I just diagonalized it, the, 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 eigen, the, di, uh, the eigenvalues of this Hessian. And the point is, by, per, by choosing alpha and beta now, if you set beta to zero, you get the gradient method back. Um, is that right? Or is this set beta to... Yeah, if you set beta to zero, you get the gradient method back. You just take a step, i minus the Hessian now, and that's the thing we were analyzing. But if I actually have a non-zero beta, what I will get is something where I can analyze what the eigenvalues do. And yeah, you just, you know, you write out your, yeah. you write out a quadratic equation, you try to find the optimal values, you get something messy, but this is the key point, if I'll find. This is the optimal values of alpha and beta. Fernando, I don't know how you know these things. You have to know the condition number. You have to know the Lipschitz constant. You have to know, that's it, okay. But still, we don't necessarily know those things. Uh, but if you were to know those parameters, the rate of convergence you get is one minus root k, root condition number plus one over two. That's much better. That's much better. So, you know, if we, we're just comparing these two rates. So in one case we have kappa for the gradient method. In the other case we have root kappa for the heavy ball method. Right? So we have these two methods that are, 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 are related to each other. Now, one way to rewrite it is let's say I wanted to get to some, I would like to get my current iterate to be epsilon times the original distance then the number of iterations for gradient descent is kappa over 2 log 1 over epsilon. But for the heavy ball method, is root kappa over 2 log 1 over epsilon. Uh, that's, a, that's a huge difference. I mean, it's like a factor. If kappa is 100, like it was in my example, that's 10 times fewer steps, which is kind of what we were seeing. Okay. All right, so that's the notion. We had, some, we had this momentum term. The momentum term drives us to 0 faster. And uh, it, it, it's, it's a big difference. And qualitatively, this is what you'll see. 
than that picture that you showed. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is this part of the uh, the reason? I mean, doesn't this usually overshoot and come back? It overshoots and come back, yeah. But it's because you're taking a. a Oh, where'd it go? Come on. This clicker is being... Your, your step is actually much bigger. So you're taking a bigger step. But then it comes back because, again, you're kind of continuing along the direction that you were previously moving. So is second order the best thing you can do? Why don't you go to third order? Third order, meaning? Can you write down a... Of, uh, third, third order. Yeah. Okay, excellent question. Can I wait two slides? Okay. That's, a good, that's an excellent question. Okay. And this will get to optimality. But yes, exactly. It's an excellent question. Um, let me first just say, related to an, another algorithm which I think more people are familiar with, which is conjugate gradients. All conjugate gradients is the exact same thing, except that I have time varying alpha k and beta k. So alpha k, what you do is you pick a line search to make the function minimize as much as possible. In the case of the quadratic, you would actually do this exactly. And beta k, in the case of quadratic, you do to make sure that all of your momentum terms are conjugate in the a basis, meaning that they're mutually orthogonal with respect to the quadratic form a. It doesn't really make sense for nonlinear. You're just like the, and that's why these algorithms are, for the nonlinear conjugate gradient, there are like five different algorithms for beta, and they're all fragile in their own way. So this was kind of this, um, I, I, I like to use the analogy that you have. This was developed, nonlinear conjugate gradient was developed uh, in the in the West during the Cold War, and it's very greedy. So you you try to minimize the line search as much as you possibly can, and you choose these betas to be, like really force these directions to be orthogonal, even though they probably don't want to be. It's a very greedy method, as opposed to the the, re the methods developed in the Soviet Union, which I'll get to in a second, which are more patient because you're waiting in line to get a potato. So I think <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have trade offs here. We have trade offs here. Uh, <laughs> So, so what's, what's interesting is this, this one does not achieve the better rate than heavy ball. And in fact, if people have looked, if you look in Golub and Van Loan at the optimal rate of convergence for the conjugate gradient method, it was the one that was on the previous slide. It's this one minus one over square root of k, square root of uh, kappa. That's the best you can do even for conjugate gradients. If you're treating conjugate gradient like an iterative method in like a high dimensional case. But this does get around having to know the parameters. Uh, and as I said, the convergence proofs are very sketchy. You have good convergence proofs for the quadratic case, but for the nonlinear case, it's not, not so cut and dry. So the question is, how do you get better? How do you actually get around having to know, uh, know the parameters alpha and beta that you should be searching for? Uh, how do you actually kind of like get something where you don't need to know the parameters and you actually have very rigorous convergence proofs? And that's where Nesterov's optimal method comes in. And Nesterov's optimal method is exactly the same. It's the same algorithm plus one modulo thing. You take the gradient of somewhere else. Uh, this isn't, bothers me. This is called an extra gradient. So basically, you take a step kind of where you think you're going in the future. It's called the, that, that's also kind of a classic thing from the 60s in optimization. So it's including, it's like really combining lots of interesting different ideas. Uh, you have the acceleration and this extra gradient. Uh, the extra gradient seems necessary to make the proofs work, but as I said, uh, I've yet to have someone explain to me why these proofs, you know I mean, again, there is no intuition, there is purely uh, calculation. So for these proofs, you get two or three page proofs. There's one in Nesterov's book. Beck and DeBool have their own. Um, if you, you look there, uh, the proofs that they use assume that you have, you kind of have an estimate of what the strong convexity parameter is. You can actually get rid of this with a very weak line search that basically just does a little bit of it back off. So you actually don't need to know this number, but the proofs use it. And then the beta term is just this crazy algebraic equation. Uh, which knows the condition number. Again, Nesterov has recently, what's interesting is he came up with this method in 1983. The Western people, when he republished it in 2004 and 2000 and so on, were kind of upset that you have to know this kappa. And subsequently, in like 2007, he was able to come up with a way of actually estimating that number too, at least getting a number such that you would get the, the rate that we were talking about before, this one over, uh, no, sorry, two over root kappa minus one. Um, Subsequently, Beck and Taboul have a somewhat simpler analysis and a somewhat simpler scheme. And this is actually the one that people use in practice. Uh, this is not guaranteed, actually, to this often in practice will get this kind of optimal convergence rate. But actually, ten, this can be dreadfully slow. So it's actually not a very robust choice. And actually, 
I, I've seen in practice that these two are pretty much the same. I like this one. Paul Sang has a nice analysis that just says this is all you need for that beta term. So you want something that tends to 1. <laughs> all right, so that's, the, that's, that's what Nesterov's optimal method is. It's really just using this notion of momentum to speed up the gradient method. And now, now we return to the, the really important question, why is it optimal? What's optimal? Um, so here is the function that it's optimal for. It's, very, it's a quadratic. And actually, that's not surprising, right? Because quadratic gradient is such a good algorithm. Uh, there's, that, that must, there must be a reason. And I think, I think if you go and look at Leuenberger's proof of the conjugate gradient rate, he's using one of these quadratics. Uh, so this is basically you have a function in Rn. You're just looking at pairwise differences and squaring them. It's a nice like Markov chain. And then we're adding a penalty to make it strongly convex. You can also turn that off, and, you, and Nesterov also uses that to show that his algorithm is even optimal when the function is convex but not strongly convex. But this function will be strongly convex, and actually you can show that the smallest second value will be mu, and the largest one will be at most 4 plus mu. And basically, when the limit as n goes to infinity, it saturates the mu in 4 plus mu. Okay. So the condition number is about this number, 1 plus 4 over mu. You can set that to be whatever you want. And so here's, here's how you prove that this is optimal, but this is only optimal if you assume that what you're allowed to do is compute function evaluations and compute gradients. Okay, those are our tool tools that we're allowed to do. You can evaluate the function, you can compute a gradient, and then you can do whatever you want on the side. But that's like the Oracle model. That's all that the function is going to tell you. Okay? So after k steps, if I'm applying the gradient, what you'll see is you're only going to get one component at a time. Because the gradient is basically going to shuffle you. You start at the first component, and you look at the gradient, you're only going to get information about the first term here. And then I do two steps, I'm going to get information about the first two terms. And so after k steps, the, my solution is equal to zero in all of the components. This is actually terrible notation. I just mean all of the components, xj to the end, are, are equal to zero. So the first k components can have something, maybe we're, and actually we're going to let us set them optimally. And then on this orthogonal complement, it's just, it has to be zero because the gradient hasn't told us anything to put, fit, fill in there. We have no better idea of what to put in there. And so what the, the norm of the optimal solution on the unseen components is exactly equal to the convergence rate of the gradient of, this, of Nesterov's method. And that's, that's the proof. So basically, that conjugate gradient rate is just given by this, this is sometimes called a resisting oracle, but it's basically something where it's just, you're not getting information out of the function at a fast enough rate. And that's why they don't do, you could do third order, and it might be better in practice. Again, this is the problem with optimality, is right? It's optimal, optimal for a Markov chain starting at that point. So uh, in practice, you can do considerably better. Basically, like a Laplacian of a path or something. It's a Laplacian of a path, exactly. That's what, exactly what it is. Questions, yeah? Maybe you want to say also that it's optimal only for dimension free results. Because here you assume that the number uh, of steps that you make uh, is more than the Yeah, 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 yeah. No, is a good point. This is true for the conjugate gradient method, too. Basically, we're kind of assuming here that the dimension is so big that we could ignore those factors. So we're almost taking this as being an infinite dimensional problem to get this rate. So it's like kind of an asymptote. But you can always chase it to make it bigger. Uh, if you have in fixed dimension, you could possibly do better. But it's kind of weird to work on algorithms that are only in, I don't know, you could do it. Someone yeah, could do it. Beta. And you could beat that. Yeah, but, uh, third order? No, no, no. no, you just use you use extra information. I mean, you use the fact that basically you're going to fill in. I mean, eventually you'll you'll fill in after k, you know if you d steps you'll have full information, so you could do better. So you can beat that rate. After d, we can do better. But it's the idea that if I can keep making the dimension bigger, I can keep coming up with functions somehow having d be a resource. Effectively the, building high order information from memory. Yeah, exactly. Other question? Oh, okay. How does this do under isometries if you apply an isometry first? I mean, would this trick still hold? The, the, the argument? Yeah. The so if you study, so first apply an isometry to the space, so the whole uh, coordinate structure is gone. So everybody gets rotated. I mean, I guess if I, but if I rotated E1, it would still be bad. You're saying, let's say, you're, how about this? You're saying, what happens if I started a random, e, a random vector? Yeah. Yeah, then you get a different rate. Because uh, now you're taking energy. I haven't done that calculation, but I don't think it would be hard to do. Because what you're going to do is you're going to take energy. Basically, the gradient method is like taking energy from each of the modes. So it's like analyzing the convergence of every mode now instead of just this kind of sequence, this worst mode. So you'd have to do, you look at the eigenstructure and then calculate those rates and you can yeah, see. The main question would the conclusion still holds? 
From a different point, no. You would get, a, I, you would get something else here. I, I just don't know what you would get. No, this is really like, this, this very, it's a very kind of fragile optimality result, but it's certainly something. It's then an example where you can't do better. And so, but, but <laughs> I agree. It's, there's actually, there's something very weird and pessimistic about these rates. And actually, I feel like, I feel like, uh, so this is the slide where I'm going to go yell at all my machine learning friends. I feel like in some sense, we're kind of wasting our time kind of quibbling about the difference in rates. Uh, so if you take away the strong convexity, take away strong convexity, then what do we get? Now we're going to get something, a very, a very dramatically different convergence rate. The gradient descent, you'll get a very similar analysis, and the optimal method, you get a very similar analysis. But instead of getting a linear rate of convergence, now we're getting something that's converging uh, in, inversely proportional to the number of iterations, or the number of iterations squared. I think the key thing that you want to take away is this one is somehow quadratically better than this one. That's the thing to take away, that the momentum is speeding it up. But not necessarily that we can really trust that these rates mean anything. Because they are always tuned to particular oracles. Um, so, I, I, and, and actually something that we're going to see in, in, in a second is actually the optimal method is not a robust method. So if we were to say, instead of having a gradient oracle, have a noisy gradient oracle, all of this would get washed out. So. Yeah, everything has to be taken with a grain of salt. We have, but we, we can analyze some things. We kind of know what the worst case behavior is, and we kind of know what an average case behavior is, and we try to kind of stitch these together. So any questions at that point about momentum, or acceleration, or gradients? The accelerated method is not robust to noise. Is not robust to noise. Here's the problem, though. It's not robust to noise, but if in machine learning problems, if you can, add a momentum term, just a constant momentum, it often makes a difference. So again, this is this very odd thing where like, we can have, we can either want, I don't know, this is actually something that's always kind of tricky in algorithms. We can have things that have guarantees or we can have things that maybe are ingredients in our toolkit that we can try to, to bring out. I think the momentum is something, it's just an idea that you want to have on your tool belt as something you could bring out that possibly could make uh, your behavior better when your conditioning is weird. But Again, we could prove things where we want to know when it goes ORI, and it will go ORI as soon as you have noise, which is where I'm going next. So we'll see that in a second. Other questions? What I like about this, we're basically doing, we're going to do a semester in an hour and a half. This is going to be good. <laughs> we have our key ingredients here. OK. Oh, I forgot. Before you even go to noise, non-convexity. I love non-convexity because it's like non-convexity just means not convex. So it's everything else. <laughs> so it's a very, very. So in some sense, we gotta think: what is non-convexity actually going to buy us? Um, if if the function is smooth and non-convex, we can still actually efficiently find a point where the the gradient nearly vanishes. You just run gradient the gradient method. You will find a point, and the analysis is very simple. Uh, the time is now instead of being one over epsilon, it's one over epsilon squared. So it's slower has a characteristic of being slower. Uh, but there's a, something that I can never get over about non-convex things. Uh, you really want to, I think you want to look at the particularity of your non-convexity. Saying so non-convexity just means not convex. So if you have a non-convex problem, you might want to bring something else to the table to do the analysis. Because for example, non-convexity just lets you model anything. So, so here's, here's my favorite non-convex function. Okay, it's just a, it's a quadratic form of arbitrary definiteness, just some coefficients, um, xi squared, xj squared, fourth order polynomial in dimension d. And zero, no matter what you do, is always the gradient vanishes there. Okay. So when the gradient vanishes, you have a point that's either a local maximum, a local minimum, or something else. <laughs> right? Something else. Who knows what it is? And checking if it's a local minimum is NP hard. You could encode knapsack here. So it's this very weird thing. So so I I, I don't know. I think from a we gotta be very weary every time we bring non-convexity in. We have to bring some other tool to the table um, because. We, this is something that nobody, nobody really, I think, I didn't take, I took for granted for a long time. Oftentimes you say, well, you can get to a local minimum, but you, you can't even get to a local minimum. If you have a smooth non-convex problem, you can't even guarantee that you're at a local minimum, unless you have extra structure to bring to the table. Okay, so that's my little, I, oh, I'm like, I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. So this is like the one place where I think people would appreciate that one. Um, okay. So let's move on to the, 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 the next subject. So remember, we had our three pillars. I should have actually brought in our, my, my pillar diagram again. We had the notion of the gradient method. That sits on everything. First pillar was 
acceleration in multi-step. The next one is the stochastic gradient algorithm and just bringing noise into the, into the equation. So I said we might want to look at a function, which is the expectation. We're going to kind of uh, looking at something which is naturally an expectation. Uh, and here's an algorithm for solving that function, assuming we can sample from the distribution. Okay. And it goes like this. We basically sample every iteration, sample from the distribution, and take a step along the gradient at that sample. Okay. It's like the gradient method, except now this gradient is a random variable. Very simple to state. Uh, it has been invented 4,000 times. In different, I forgot to add, there's one extra here. And I don't know where my friend who was talking about the cash marks method was. I don't know who's that. That's also here. The, the cash marks method is also stochastic gradient. So we have like five different inv inventions of the exact same algorithm, uh, starting with Robinson Monroe. Um, and you have many different analyses. We'll do one today because it's, it's fairly straightforward. OK, so this is the, um, now let me just, the reason why it's nice and the reason why it's kind of interesting for these kinds of problems is that the algorithms themselves are trivial. The stochastic gradient algorithm is, it like, couldn't be easier. It's even easier than the gradient method. So if we look at our SVM and we just kind of bunch everything together so it has the right form, and I treat this now as a sample average, so I would just sample one of these guys at random. I would compute the sign, I would compute the assignment. If I get the sign right, I don't do anything. If I get the sign wrong, I basically take my old model and just add in proportional of the new example. So is the perceptron it is the perceptron algorithm. algorithm. Exactly, exactly. This is the perceptron algorithm. Is that the same thing as coordinate descent? No. It's not coordinate descent because we're moving along this example. We're moving in all coordinates. Oh, you're moving in all coordinates. But only on this example. Z, Z is just like the, the current training example. And it's, but it is called the perceptron algorithm. And this, this is basic, it's kind of a well-known, very, very well-studied algorithm. And actually, we'll solve this problem. Yeah? So why did you not take a step in case it was, the sign was correct? You, do, you still get the regularized term in the gradient, right? Think about the, uh, oh, true, 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 true. That's a good point. Actually, you should, you should if you, if you yeah, you shrink by a very little amount. Yeah, you're right, you're right. That's fair. I don't do that when I run it, that's though. <laughs> I'll be honest. And that's the change from perceptron. Yeah, that's the big change for perceptron. Yeah, like, technically, that's a great point. Technically, you really should incorporate this term. But hopefully, n is 40 billion, and so you don't actually have to do that. You don't even re usually, you don't even regularize this. You, don't, you just you just take this and add this in. That works really well. It's kind of probably placing ads on your phone as we speak. So... Um, Matrix completion is another one. This is a this is a very funny algorithm where non convexity comes in. I don't have, I can't talk about this in detail today, but uh, it, I, I, this is this is just a, a fascinating thing. What you do is you take your semi you know this very complicated problem, you refactor your decision variable, and once you plug in that refactorization, it turns out that this original nuclear norm problem is equivalent to this non convex nonlinear program. Which okay, it's kind of weird. We take a convex problem and rewrite it as a very low dimensional. Uh, non-convex problem. However, you could, there's analyses that kind of deal with this. But well, what's really interesting is the stochastic gradient algorithm here will just sample an entry, uh, compute your, basically, how wrong am I on that entry? So all that requires is looking at one row in L and one column of R. That computes my sample residual. And then my update, again, is really, really simple. Only needs to look at that row in that column. And this was the... Uh, that was the algorithm that kind of was like the first published result on the Netflix prize was just that stochastic gradient algorithm. It did really well. Almost embarrassing that Netflix didn't try it. So that's kind of a, another cute thing where this thing works kind of unreasonably well. All right, so it's kind of just one of these things where I think this is one of these ideal al algorithms for big data analysis. I mean, you have this thing where the footprint is really reliable. It's just you work on an example by example basis. It's very robust against noise, which I don't have time to talk about today. We'll see that it converges very quickly. Uh, it gives you one algorithm to prototype everything on. And the real question is just why should this work? That's our question for the day. Why should it work? All right, so here, here, here's why it should work. We're going to start with the Robinson Monroe example, which is looking at that least squares problem. Somebody can tell me the answer. It's two and a half. The household value is two and a half. We're just going to compute the mean. And here's how you compute it, right? So step one is you start at x0. We're going to pick a step size, very particular step size, 1 over 2k. I, I know this in advance, so that should work. You take one step, you get one. Two steps, you get on. OK, well, you get the mean. That's kind of cool. You're just, doing, you're just taking averaging. I mean, that's basically what this is doing. And so in general, if we minimize this thing over n terms, you always get the mean. 
So in 1D, very kind of intuitive, but we didn't even need, I don't need, there's nothing random here. I went through them in order. There's nothing stochastic. It's not really a, it just said that if I have a function written out as sums, I, I can march through the derivative of the in, uh, individual summands, and uh, that gives me a good answer. But the randomness actually gets interesting as soon as you move away from one dimension. Look at this problem. So this is a least squares problem. The optimal value is 0, 0. It's a very deceptive least squares problem. It really is just the identity. It's just x squared plus. It's a fancy version of x1 squared plus x2 squared. You guys, learn, you know, practice your trig identities there. Uh, and this generalizes to any, I mean, any number of summands. We can get one of these. And so if I just start at that point and I take a constant step size, basically then the operation is just multiplied by, the, by a cosine sine matrix. And so just the illustration is that you get very, very slow convergence if you go through them in order. But if I were actually to pick them at random, uh, you actually converge after a few steps. Kind of, this is actually tends to be, this looks like it's a worst case example, but that's good, it's fine. So it really points out the randomness does help us kind of to, to cancel these terms out. Um, so let me go through a convergence proof because it's exactly, I, I kind of, the thing I want to hammer uh, in every example in this talk is that the convergence proofs look almost the same. You assume the same thing. We assume that the true function, the expectation, sorry, I should have written E of F here. So it's E of F. We assume the expectation is strongly convex. So the function we're trying to minimize is strongly convex. Uh, and then that each sample, we're kind of getting an unbiased estimate of the gradient. Okay, so at every iteration, what we're doing is we're trying to minimize this function F, and we're just getting an unbiased sample of the gradient that's independent of the past. That's basically what we're assuming. And we're assuming the, the big assumption we make is that the, these, these stochastic gradients have bounded noise, or bounded uh, norm. You can also, if you want, you can assume that they just have bounded second moment, but this is just easier for today. It's bounded norm. Okay, so here's, okay, we're doing the same thing that we did in the gradient method. You take, just write, step one always, write out what your iteration is, and then step two is expand out the square. That's almost always what we do. And in that square, uh, we have a few terms. Let me define the expected distance to the optimal solution is AK. And then we have this expression. So the expected distance at k, step k plus 1 is where we were before, minus this term, which is just the stochastic gradient times the difference, minus the step size. And then we're just going to, again, now just impute that. We're just going to apply the fact that these gradients are all bounded. OK, so that's our recursion. We just got to kind of clean this one up. And the way you can clean that up is first, if we iterate expectation, you can actually uh, you just condition on the past and take the expected value just with the current iterate. You see that what you get is the dot product of xk minus the optimal solution uh, dot product with the gradient at f. The true gradient, not the gradient, uh, not the stochastic gradient. That's kind of nice. We just iterate out this guy. That's the, an expectation. Um, and the second fact is that we can, use, we can actually lower bound this using strong convexity. The point is that this guy is lower bounded by the dif distance to the optimal solution. Right, we can go through the details, but it's just, trust me, this, this guy is lower bounded by the distance to the optimal solution. This just uses the definition of strong convexity twice. Lower bound one, and then lower bound two. So if we plug that in, our recursion is now much simpler. The distance to the optimal solution at step k plus one is this kind of uh, uh, one contractive term to my last iteration plus a constant offset. And now that's easy to analyze. So I've kind of now in expectation, you, come, you just have to come up with a step size that makes that converge. Okay, and there are lots of different ones. So let's just go through two examples. One is we take really big steps. We take big steps so that this guy actually is an oscillating, oscillates back and forth. So that term is negative. The first term is negative. Uh, and that what, what that will achieve is that you'll get a one over k rate. After k iterations, we're a proportion of one over k uh, times the distance to the optimal solution. So it's a rate of convergence of 1 over k. Um, which, remember, the optimal method should get 1 over k squared. Actually, it should be linear. It should be an exponential convergence. So it's actually even worse. So we're, we're stuck with slow rates here. Um, another way to actually get the same thing, which is actually much more robust in practice, if you want to code this up, use constant step sizes that are small. Just use constant step sizes that are small, and then every once in a while, make your step size smaller. That's what this doesn't. This algorithm. This works in analysis and is kind of awful and brittle in practice. This one is very. This is a nice, robust, dumb algorithm. This is actually kind of a, uh, was initially um, 
proposed by the electrical engineers. So this is kind of their old adaptive filtering idea from the 60s. And you can analyze this and still get the 1 over k rate. You have to just come up with a schedule for reducing the step size. OK, so in either case, we can get a nice 1 over k rate of convergence. And you know what? The 1 over k rate is optimal. In this case, it's optimal. All you have to think is, like, let's say I'm trying to minimize the least squares difference between x and, um, between x and some mean, x star. I should just write this down. It's really easy. You're just minimizing the expected value of x minus x star <coughs> squared and just like make it Gaussian noise. So assume that at every step, when I ask for the gradient, I just add Gaussian noise to it. The central limit theorem says that it's going to take one of our case steps to average that noise out. And that's basically, so that's why it's unavoidable. So even the, an oracle which, with that information, with these gradients, couldn't do better. Paper of Ashinin somebody was referring to, right? Yeah. It gives you linear. Yeah. Lines. So what is their, th so they cheat. So they look at a very, very special class. Right. So what they have is that their stochastic gradient, this term, um, they don't bound it by m squared. What they actually have is that they have, they have the case where the gradients at the optimal solution, the, even the stochastic gradients at the optimal solution, vanish. And so actually the, the, um, you can bound this in terms of the distance to the optimal solution. And if you can bound this in terms of the distance to the optimal solution, you get a linear rate of convergence. And that's all you need. They also use length squared sampling for the... That is only to make their bound look nice. You don't need that. You still get a linear rate of convergence. You just get a different linear rate of convergence. They use the, and, and it's very weird because if, um, so not to go on too much of a tangent, but the problem they're looking at is sum of AI transpose X minus B I squared, right? Which is kind of solving the least squares problem, AX equals B, exactly. They assume that there's a solution where this vanishes everywhere. Uh, and so all, if you're doing length squared, I can multiply this by, pre-multiply this by a diagonal matrix, get a completely identical problem, and then they're all equal norm. So it's a little bit of a fishy. It makes the bound look nice when you do length squared sampling, but it's not, it's not, necess it's not necessarily even true that uniform sampling isn't better. Um, but that's right, that's that, that Vershinian paper. And if you look, so here's the, here's the other thing. If you look in Polyak's book from 1987, he, he does prove that. He does prove that if the gradient is going to zero, uh, if the noise is going to zero as you approach the optimal solution, you get linear rate of convergence. So it's kind of was, again, so known to a certain batch of Russians. There was like five of them. They sat in the office and smoked all the time. I think this was... <laughs> You say, if anybody's actually curious about that, you should talk to Katja Steinberg, who was an undergrad researcher in this lab. Where these old Russian guys were all smoking, <laughs> and like, she had to go. He's, yeah, Nestor got healthy when he came to the States. Nemirovsky, not so much. <laughs> so let's look at that. So, okay, so sadly, that, that rate is slow. But uh, if we look at it again in terms of just, it's all about how we amortize and look at these different bounds, right? If we look at. Uh, the Newton method, which I didn't talk about today, the Newton method actually gives you quadratic convergence. You get a doubly exponential convergence. So if I took t steps of the Newton method and I was in a reasonable basin, I have a reasonable function, uh, I'm basically taking log log 1 over epsilon is how my error would scale. And the number of iteration scales is log log 1 over epsilon. But the time to compute the iteration is going as the dimension cubed. And definitely not favorable with the data either. It's d squared n. The gradient method is a much faster algorithm. That's kind of why we were, we're studying that. And that's dn. Uh, and that gets this linear rate of convergence. And our poor stochastic gradient method uh, is O of d. But as we saw, we had examples where it was like the matrix completion example. It's a constant amount of work per iteration. Uh, and now we have cs over, over t. So it's a 1 over t iteration. So if I was just looking at that table, I would say it's, it's a little bit hard to kind of look at exactly what is the right thing to do. However, let's say all I will, I'm going to let you do, this is a database. My sum is stored in a database. And you have to look at each individual item. How many calls to the database do you need? So if we look at, say, let's say we can do n items, and we sample at random, then Newton's method gets us, both Newton's method and the gradient method gets some constant towards the optimal solution. And we, you know, OK, fine, one step. However, after one pass over the data, we've made a substantial amount of progress. And if n is a very large number, we probably could just stop after just one pass through the data. And that's why it's so appealing on, all, uh, on these kind of applications. Any questions about stochastic gradient? 
There's one last piece. We can go as fast, or you can tell me I can stop now if you do. You guys want to go have a beer we, late in the day. Uh, so I would just say there, there are lots of extensions. If John Ducci was here, he'd be jumping up and down about all these other things. Most of them are really boring. It's kind of the same stuff. This extra <laughs> applications. I mean, you want to have this idea that we can get this very nice, uh, we get this polynomial time convergence for, for smooth functions. For, for non-smooth functions, apparently it's slower. Uh, the thing is that if I'm looking at an expectation, so they're saying the increments themselves are, are non-smooth. But in expectation, um, we don't really know. It could be smooth. We don't know the distribution. You could take the expected value of non-smooth functions and get something smooth. And in fact, that's what it seems like. This is incredible. 1 over root k is so slow. Uh, and almost across the board in optimization, if you can prove something converges, it's n almost never worse than 1 over root k using these kind of techniques. And, and that is, that's a terrible rate. It's, it's really slow. So who knows? Anyway, non-convex, non this actually was what was done in neural networks. In neural networks, this algorithm is called backpropagation. You can prove that this converges uh, asymptotically. Nobody really knows how fast in that case. Um, you can do stochastic coordinate descent where you pick a bunch of random coordinates, try to do some, some steps there. And uh, actually, what's a lot of people, and it's been a very active area, and hopefully will be a lot of talks about this in October, uh, it's a very, uh, very interesting area of how to optimally parallelize this algorithm. A lot of work on that. OK, but that's all I would like to say about stochastic gradient. And we're just going to end with projected gradient. And then we have all of the pieces together. We have randomness we brought in. We have uh, we have basically acceleration and momentum, which is a useful concept, and now we get constraints. You guys wanted some constraints. And this is not the only way to deal with constraints. Oftentimes, this is where interior point methods would probably be a better idea. But there's, there, let me just give you something stupid that works when that is convex, and f is at least smooth. This works for non-smooth too, but let's make it simple. Let's suppose I can solve the Euclidean projection onto omega, and omega is a, cost, a convex function. Let's assume that, that accrues some complexity, but I have, an, I have an algorithm that will just do that for me. Uh, this is always unique, because this is a, uh, if I square it, I get a strongly convex function, uh, subject to convex constraints. And this is the projected gradient method. So you take a step along the gradient. So v here will be negative gradient. And then just project onto the set and iterate. So I have done nothing. And actually, the nice thing is the analysis is exactly the same because of one crucial feature. Okay, so everybody understand the algorithm is pretty simple. Take a gradient step, project onto omega. Project what the omega? The gradient step. Take the Euclidean projection of the gradient step onto the set omega, the closest point in omega. That's my iterate. Okay. Everybody else clear on that? All right. So here, here's here's the proof of how this works, and we can go. I mean, I have 20 minutes, so maybe I'll even get in more generality. But let's just do this. You just the only lemma you need is that if I take the projection onto a convex set, that, that doesn't move the points farther apart. They can only get closer when I take the projection. And if I do that, now we just follow our nose, what am I going to do? I'm going to look at the distance to the optimal solution. I write out what the definition of the iteration is. I'm kind of assuming that the true optimal solution lies in omega somewhere. Uh, that's non-expansive, so I can just pull off the projection. And now you guys, now we all know what to do. That, that's a non-expansive map, and then we get a linear rate of convergence. So we basically inherit all of the nice stuff from the gradient method just using this one lemma. And so constraints are kind of like in the, in the picture too. So if you have easy constraints to project onto, you can you can now deal with constraints. Okay, and and we get this basically the more general version. Is, is called the proximal point method, and this is a good thing to know about. So it, it was this ridiculous, there was a ridiculous trend at, at NIPS for like three or four years where you would just write, you would come up with a new uh, way of solving this problem. Just basically quadratic, simple quadratic plus P, where P would be something. And you do that, NIPS paper. <laughs> Done. It's like always the same analysis, or, or even worse. Even, uh, <laughs> He's not here again. But anyway, I was going to make fun of John. What you could also do was you would just like take this and you add great. You do now do gr stochastic gradient descent with this projection. Okay, great. This paper. It's just like you know all of these algorithms and all these proofs are very much the same thing. And I think that's fine. For for a start, we were uh, uh, Nesterov and Nemirovsky weren't there to scold us. Now they can come and scold us and say you guys don't have to do that. There are more. There are better things for you to use your time on. All these things are going to work. So we want to minimize this function. We basically take a linear approximation, just like we've been doing. We have kind of our, now I have a, the step size here, uh, and we have p of x. Uh, I define my proximal point mapping to just be this minimization. So, okay, a canonical example of p 
let's have a PB0 on a set omega and infinity off the set omega. Then this is equivalent to the problem on the previous slide. That's a nice convex function. Another example where this would be a norm. And so we'll go through a couple of examples in a second, but let me say this is the proximal gradient method. We basically do this linearization, add this little quadratic term, and minimize. Note that if p isn't there, this is just the gradient method. It's actually kind of interesting. What the gradient descent method is doing is make a very dumb quadratic approximation to f and minimize that. We make another dumb approximation to f and then minimize that. Here we make a dumb approximation, but we don't do anything with p, and we minimize that. That's called the proximal point method. And, oops, and we, uh, again, we can analyze this. Oh, that's what we'll finish with. We'll just do a quick analysis of this. But let me give you, again, some examples. So I said if p of x, this thing is, this is the convex optimization version of the indicator function. I guess it's log of the, uh, of the combinatorial optimization version of the indicator function. So you just take your choice there. It's zero on the set, and then infinity off of the set. Minus log of the standard one. But this is kind of nice. So what it says is basically, I'm infeasible outside the set, so I have an infinite cost. And, if I'm gonna, and then I pay no cost if I'm inside the set. Okay, and the projection, the, the proximal point mapping is just the Euclidean projection in that case. Uh, more interestingly, and kind of like, this is probably the most popular version, is if it's the L1 norm, or mu times the L1 norm, the proximal point mapping does this. Shrinkage. It's like iter iterative shrinkage, or this is kind of what is this statistical shrinkage. Now, tying optimization back to James Stein, right? So basically, we, uh, we just take our mu value is here. If you're inside that mu window, you set your, your coordinate to zero, and otherwise, you shrink towards the origin. And so that's the proximal mapping. And again, that's a non expansive mapping. <coughs> and again, the key lemma to make the proximal point method work. And this is very, it was really not a hard thing to prove. I think I might, I can't remember if I left it in or not, but if you want to see the proof, I mean, I know it's late. If you want to see, Sebastian, come talk to me afterwards. I'll show you the two line proof. I think you're probably the only one with the stamina left. But anyway, if you want to see the proof, it's very simple and it, it's really kind of intuitive, but this is also non-expansive. And just, just like before, this implies all of the rates of convergence from, uh, from, from the linear method now apply to this case. Yeah? What assumptions are required on P for this? Convex. That's it, convex. Yeah. That's, it's actually kind of, it's quite remarkable. It's just convex. Yeah. And there's an interesting case where, P, where f is 0 is actually a very interesting algorithm. That's called the proximal point method. So where f is 0 is basically all you do is you iterate, just apply, you keep applying successively the prox thing. And that actually is, a, that was an algorithm of Rockefeller. Uh, the, this, this came, this was an algorithm of Fukushima and Mini that combined these two together. This was from the 80s. It's like an kind of old classic algorithm. But yeah, the proximal point method itself actually, uh, who, so who's heard of ADMM? A couple people. I was going to give references at the end because I don't have time to talk about it. ADMM is applying proximal point method to, uh, um, to a dual decomposition problem. But can't talk about that today. Okay. Sorry, uh, one little remark. Yeah. I think the projection gradient method is what Nikhil and some people use for network flows recently. Is that? Uh, well, well, a lot of people have. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, well, recently, I guess, Jonah Sherman and Kelner. I mean, but people have been, I guess, using, that was, people have been using various other gradient methods before. Yeah. But it uh, seems, it's, but it's recently, yeah, so there's a linear time algorithm for max flow now. Based using on projected. Uh, using using projected gradient? Linear in, in E? So it's, it's uh, a linear in number of edges. Yeah. So Sherman and uh, Kellner, Lee, or Richie. Yeah. Can't prove that. I would believe that because 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 max fl wait min flow or ma uh, max flow max flow min cut min cut min, 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 min cut as we wrote is actually just an L one problem. Yeah, yeah. It says min L one subject to box constraints. So it's actually it's a it's kind of a natural uh, nonlinear programming problem. And so it's it's nice that you can actually bring this analysis to bear. Um, and so there are other variants which again I can't talk about today. One of them is ADMM. ADMM is this proximal point mapping that you use lots of prox operators. It allows this is what I was saying. It's one of these modular algorithms. So if you have something where you have a non-negativity constraint and then you have some other you know some other uh, uh, some constraint, you can put those together. Uh, and, and the reason why I didn't talk about it is because Stephen Boyd has a beautiful one-hour YouTube you can watch, and uh, he really does it a lot better than me. And he has these very breezy very readable lecture notes on ADMM that are I just recommend everybody read. They're really great. There's something to aspire to in scientific writing. I don't know how he does that. 
Uh, and then the other one that's kind of interesting, and this is more from the, this also is from 1983 in the Soviet Union, is the mirror descent algorithm. Uh, the mirror descent algorithm is just using the fact that gradient descent basically always had a, a quadratic term here. You can use other terms. You basically just need something that's strongly convex over the constraint set that you're optimizing. So for example, if you're optimizing over the simplex, you can use entropy. And that turns out to be a much faster algorithm. And that's the basis behind mirror descent. But, but note that the, basically it's just the exact same idea. You come up with an approximation, minimize that approximation, and iterate. Why is it called mirror descent? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's, uh, it's in this book. Because uh, you go into mural space. So you can use this as your diagonal space, and you apply your mural map. You go into mural space, and you do a gradient step in the mural space. By mirror, you mean the dual space. The other thing that's kind of weird about mirror descent is there are really only three algorithms. There's gradient descent, there's this thing where you have you use the entropy over the simplex, and then you could have the quantum entropy over the spectrohedron. So there are three algorithms, they're called mirror descent, they all kind of have the same analysis, but it's very basically those other two are real special cases. But yes, it's really be uses, beautiful theory. What? And nobody uses any other other than entropy and quantum entropy, yeah, and most people don't even use quantum entropy. It's usually not. Uh, it's usually not faster than what you would stand because you have to do an SVD. So it's usually not faster than what people typically do. But there anyway, are a few other maps, but, but not using in optimization, but for bandit problems. Oh, well, there are other mirrors. Yes, yes, completely different ones. Oh, oh, maybe we'll have Sebastian give a special. Oh, you have ten minutes. You can come tell us. <laughs> All right, so, so that was in the hour and 20. That was basically something that, uh, that was a co the contents of a course that I taught at Wisconsin last fall. Uh, so uh, obviously that was too much, but it kind of gives you, I think the thing you want to take away is that they're really in kind of um, fast, high-dimensional optimization. Um, there are basically three key ideas that have been per pervasive over the past 10 years and that people have really been optimizing the, the heck out of. And that's, that's using kind of accelerated methods and, and momentum to kind of speed up convergence. Uh, being able to use stochastic gradient both as a way to deal with noise, but also as a way to kind of deal with the way that data is laid out uh, on disk. And uh, the projected and proximal method is a simple way to integrate constraints. Kind of that gives us everything for today. Um, just a reminder, tomorrow I'm going to give me a completely different style of talk. So this was kind of implementation and algorithms kind of given this, this statement. Tomorrow I want to talk about how we use optimization to prove things and just talk about how, we, how, how duality plays a key role in areas of, of compressed sensing, matrix completion, and related areas. So that's, that'll be tomorrow, bright and early. Uh, we can all go have a nap now. So thanks. <laughs>